get ready with our webinar. All right, so make sure everybody's in the right place. We are hosting tonight's Ask Me Anything with Dr. Katie Novak. Um, this is the UDL IRN's Network and Learn. I was checking the other day and um, it looked like we have over 20 Network and Learns already recorded. So this is like 21 or 22. We've been at this for a while and, and actually this is one of my favorite um, flavors of Network and Learn. We do several varieties, but the Ask Me Anything is always, I think, one of the best. It's our chance to really dig in deep and uh, get to ask questions of people in the field and really hear from them how, um, see if I need that in there, uh, how they uh, interact with UDL and their take on our community. So we're gonna go ahead and um, uh, again, do our Network and Learn with Dr. Katie Novak. Uh, I'll be moderating this evening. Uh, my name's Sue Harden and I'm on the UDL IRN board. With me tonight is uh, Steve Nordmark. Steve is uh, going to be monitoring our Twitter chat. He is our uh, UDL IRN's chief operating officer and also joining us is Corinne Hauer. And Corinne will be moderating the um, chat on the Zoom webinar. And Corinne is, um, uh, in UDL leader in Michigan and also on our UDL IRN professional development um, committee. So we're glad to have you with us tonight. It takes a whole village to host these Network and Learns. Um, just a reminder, this is interactive. So our Ask Me Anything questions, these are chances for you to talk to our uh, guest of the night. Your questions matter. We really wanna hear what you have to say. That's what this is all about. So um, get on Twitter. If you wanna uh, tweet a question to Katie, it's hashtag UDLIRN and Steve will grab that question and uh, pose it to Katie throughout the evening. Uh, if you are joining us on the Zoom webinar, you can post your, chat, your question right in our chat. So tonight's uh, Ask Me Anything will go a little bit like this. Now, this is just sort of a, a guidelines, if you will. These are not set in stone. Um, these tend to be surprising and we end up on journeys we never expected. But for the most part, the plan is to start with uh, Katie sharing with us her UDL journey uh, and why she came to and how she came to UDL. Then we'll take some questions um, from the Twitter crowd or the chat crowd. And then we'll uh, ask Katie to transition to tell us a little bit about her UDL passion. And then take some more questions and then back to uh, her UDL legacy, a few more questions and then some final thoughts. And that will be it for our hour. So I'd like to just take a moment to introduce Katie um, before she starts. Let's see. And um, so that we all know, I'm sure all of you do know who Katie is, but it's nice to have uh, a formal introduction. So uh, Katie is uh, right now an educational consultant. She's a practicing school administrator. She's the assistant superintendent of schools in, in Massachusetts. Uh, and most importantly, she's a teacher at heart. She's the author of four books on UDL. Now, Katie, is this true? Are three forthcoming in 2019? Yes, that is very true. <laughs> wow. You're going to have to tell us about that because that is so impressive. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would love to. I'm really excited about the collaboration. So all of them are co-authored. So I get to throw some really cool shout outs out. All right. Great. Um, and so um, I'd like you to just share a little bit more about who you are, Katie. I'm going to actually get out of the share and I'm going to put the spotlight on you. Um, and if we won't be uh, seeing the screen then it'll just be you and I chatting. So I'm going to stop that now. And just a reminder, make sure you send your questions through the chat and through um, Twitter. So we'll go ahead and let you get started. So just tell us a little bit about uh, your UDL journey. What brought you to UDL? Why, why are um, you here to talking to us tonight? And how'd you get here? Um, so I was a, a teacher. I was an English teacher for almost 12 years. And when I was teaching, I was in, um, I started out in California and moved back to my kind of, to my roots in Massachusetts. 
and I was a seventh grade English teacher. And while I was teaching um, my district, this is like an amazing story of how stars align, but CAST at the time was working with a grant from the Gates Foundation, as far as I understand it, doing a study called the Tale of Four Districts. And districts kind of all over the country, you know, got to apply for this grant. And this is what really impacted and, and like helped to inform the work on the UDL implementation cycle. So the question was really like, what does it take to move through the phases of like explore, prepare, implement, optimize, and scale in a school district? So they were looking for four school districts to be kind of case studies of how this worked. And the district that I happened to be in was a district chosen for one of those case studies. Um, and that was Chelmsford, um, Massachusetts. And so I had never heard about the UDL framework. I didn't write the grant. I had no part in any of this. And uh, the assistant superintendent at the time, Kristen Rodriguez, you know, reached out to me and was like, hey, you know, I've been in your classroom a couple times. Um, you know, you have a pretty strong reputation here. And I know that you just got your doctorate. And so, you know, clearly you're looking for kind of like a next step. And so do you want to be like in a leadership role? And I'm like, no, not for me. Like, totally wasn't interested at all. And the reason was I had just finished a doctorate program at Boston University. And I was pregnant with my first, um, who is now almost 10. And I was like, no, like, you know, I'm always trying these new things. You know, I'm doing looking at student work protocols and, you know, I'm involved in newspaper and journalism. Like I'm all set. Thank you. And she's like, no, like, I really feel like this framework would be like such a good match. And I'm like, no, thank you. Like, I'm not interested, but here's the catch. And this is how like the universe always gets you to a place you're supposed to be is because I was on my first maternity leave and I was going to take a long time. I was going to take it unpaid and the UDL opportunity paid <laughs> like there was a stipend for it. So I have to admit like very, very like selfishly, the only reason that I said yes to be a part of the tale of four districts is because I was going on an unpaid maternity leave and um, it, I was offered a stipend for the work. And so I'm like, yeah, I'll go. And so I went to this like two week summer intensive kind of UDL training where I got to meet like Grace Mayo and um, Patty Rallabay and Peggy Coyne and David Rose, you know, all a part of this crew who retired. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm into this. Like this speaks to me as an educator. And as part of this like amazing, amazing opportunity, um, they would send people out from cast like monthly to come and like interview you and observe you in your classroom and give you feedback. And it's basically something that would like never be replicated. It was just such an amazing moment in time. And as one of the interviews, um, they kind of talked about like, you know, what do you feel like would have been really helpful for UDL, you know, and what's your best resource? And I'm like, I think my best resource is probably myself. And I wasn't saying it to be fresh, although it sounds kind of fresh. Um, it was more like, you have to know yourself as a teacher because UDL is so much about like personalized pathways and no one can tell you your first step. No one can tell you the best resource. No one can give you a format. You have to like really believe in your ability to teach all kids and kind of craft an expert journey. Um, and I don't think I said it that eloquently at the time. I probably was like, I'm my own best resource. And David Rose heard it on video and was like, she is hilarious. And kind of like the rest is history, um, you know, because when I met with him, he's like, you're the one who said you're your own best resource. I'm like, uh, yeah, like <laughs> I think every teacher is their own best resource. And I stand by that today that like what makes you really successful is everything you already have inside yourself. And that can absolutely be optimized and scaled through collaboration and professional learning and professional development. But the reality is, is, is what brought us to the classroom is the same thing that's going to allow us to be really, really successful. So that is where I started as a classroom teacher. Um, I learned about it as a classroom teacher, and I always take that with me in that everything I'm doing is really trying to craft a learning experience that works for the most people possible. Wow, that is a fascinating story. I, met, I did not know that story. <laughs> Um, it's wonderful that not only the stars aligned, but a little money got tucked in your pocket along the way too. That always, always Benjamin's, yeah. 
<laughs> um, and I didn't know that you went all the way back to the tale of four districts and Grace Mayo Day. That's great. Yes, yes. And so that is also out of the tale of four districts. That's how I met George Van Horn and Liz Burquest and Joni Degner. All so many of us were a part of that tale of four districts and met through the collaboration meetings as a part of that research study. That's great. Yeah, Grace was my first uh, UDL teacher too. Grace and Peggy Coyne. Yep, yep. <laughs> that means we're old. That's all that means, you know. That. <laughs> <laughs> More like, I like the word antique, like <laughs> classier. Yeah, yeah. Kind, of, yeah, kind of hip. Okay, so that's your beginning. So tell us a little bit about where you're at now. Where, what is your current state of UDL passion? Because I know you, have, you write about a lot of different topics. You have a lot of things that you like to share um, about UDL and, and what it, uh, how it makes you feel, how it makes you good as an educator, how you share that with others. But what's your current passion today? What's your focus today? So, um, I mean, I, I think that one of the most important things that we can do right now, or what I can do right now, so I work as a point eight assistant superintendent of schools in Massachusetts, and then the other point two, which is about 52 days a year, um, I work as an education consultant. And whether I'm in my own district or whether I'm in other districts, I think we face a real significant problem with teacher burnout. Um, the level of expectations we put on teachers and the mandates that are unfunded, and I don't mean unfunded only financially, but unfunded with professional development, you know, unfunded with motivation. Um, I feel that the, the true greatest resource we have in classrooms is getting really tired of all of this stuff coming from the outside, which is taking away teacher autonomy. And the thing that I feel really passionate about UDL is UDL is not taking away teacher autonomy. In fact, I feel like it's, you know, actually like highlighting the importance of teacher autonomy. And there's a little bit of a shift because we're moving from this like one size fits all and deciding what the experience of one student is going to be. And instead stepping back and facilitating what are all the possible experiences that students in my classroom could have in order to meet this goal. And to do that, you have to know your students. You have to build relationships and you have to create conditions of nurture. And that puts the teacher in the driver's seat because there is no curriculum, there is no strategy that anybody could give you that's going to come out of a box that's gonna allow you to suddenly feel this great success with every student. And I feel like a lot of the educational um, framework and pushes that are coming out are feel packaged to me. Like if you just do this, if you just buy this curriculum, then all kids could learn. And we forgot the importance of relationships, um, relationships with kids, relationship with teachers. And again, that goes vertically and horizontally and collaboratively. And, you know, I feel like my biggest passion right now is you know, really like fighting for teachers to, to feel like they have a voice in education again. And I feel like in some ways that has gotten lost. We know we talk about what curriculum you buy and what assessments you use and what strategies you create. And none of this works without teachers, none of it. And that is, I think, where I'm most passionate right now. And so um, I always like joke to my husband, I'm like the Ed Sharon of UDL, you know, because Ed Sharon, he's like totally badass, but he worked with everybody. He works with like Eminem and then he works with like Taylor Swift and he's always collaborating. And I find myself in these amazing collaborations with people very different from myself, but we what the, the thing that keeps me connected to so many different educators kind of around the world um, is that we believe that teachers are, are our greatest resource. And we believe that teachers are the ones who have lost out in all of these education mandates that are meant to help students as if they're not the most important piece. Yeah, I, I think you're uh, right on with that idea of classroom culture and building those relationships and and building a community where we where we all respect each other where we're um, collaborating whether it's the teacher to teacher the students in the classroom teachers and students just building this place where uh, all teachers and students feel valued is what I hear you saying and that I, I couldn't agree more I think that's so important um, all of the strategies and resources can get built on top of that, but without that, um, nothing else uh, is gonna make a matter to kids or, or to, to learning. Um, so I, 
love to listen to you tell stories about your journey and about your passions. And I just wonder, tell us what, how do you recharge at the end of the day? So we talk, you talk a lot about charging up teachers and making sure that they have the energy and the passion to do what they need to do. But how do you recharge? Tell us a little bit about Katie. Gosh, that's a hard question. So, um, you know, I, I kind of have like a bunch of constants in my, in my world. I love, love spending time with my kids. I think I have four kids, a nine-year-old twin, seven-year-olds and a three-year-old and like getting to spend time with them is just amazing and hilarious. So, um, lately the fun thing we've been doing in our house is, I don't know if anyone's heard of, you know, elf on a shelf, which is this like creepy doll that comes and does weird things. And I'm like, this is a learning opportunity if I've never seen one. So I felt as though if if the elf could bring clues every day, we could have conversations at night about all like the evidence that we have and like making inferences and solving like some sort of like big case. So um, the big secret, which we found out this Saturday is that we ended up adopting a seven-year-old dog, a former therapy dog. And he's absolutely amazing. His name is Emerson, but we had two weeks of clues leading up to this. Um, and it was just like so much fun every night, like writing out the clues, very beautiful mind, like making lines and we were making videos and like, just like being fully involved as a mom with my kids is like the best part of every day. So, you know, when I travel, we FaceTime at night. After I get off this, we're going to go upstairs and read stories. And so like, I always think about everything as a learning opportunity. And, and one of the things that's hard is I hear people saying all, everything that's going on education is making it less fun. And I'm like, no, like standards doesn't make anything less fun. You know, it's all about, we have this like need to learn. And I think that my need to learn transcends like every part of my life. So, you know, as a mom, I want to make things really interesting. I have an amazing group of very, very close friends that we get to together with all the time. Um, I'm really into like all things exercising. So whether it's a walk or a hike or a run. Um, and then I also have a really, really secret, terrible habit of watching really bad TV. Um, I'm a huge Bachelor, Bachelorette fan. Um, I watch Bachelor in Paradise. I watch Bachelor Winter Olympics. Olympics. Um, and that's like the only time where I'm like, you know what, like, I'm just going to let it go. I'm going to let the brain dump, but I would say, you know, family exercise and really bad TV. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a great formula for, yeah, it is. it's pretty solid. <laughs> I think it's real interesting when, um, cause I, I'd like to hear that from a lot of people. I ask that my friends as well, but I think it's real interesting when people recharge by being around other people. Mm -hmm. So many people want to recharge by just stepping back, but it sounds like you like to dive right in and get in with people to recharge uh, at yeah. times too. That's great. I don't need very much alone time and I don't need very much sleep either, which has worked out pretty well for me. <laughs> <laughs> and your kids and, and your teachers and right. Yeah, that's great. All right. Um, I'm going to throw it in, out to our, um, outside audience. So we've got Corinne, I think that I saw a few questions come in in the chat. If you want to share um, what you're seeing come in in Zoom chat. Absolutely. Um, so Katie Thomas Tobin is on this evening and Thomas's yeah. question, <laughs> um, he said from the uh, cold crisp state of um, Pennsylvania. So how was the UDL implementation rubric being received and used? So I'm super curious about that myself too. So thank you, Tom, for asking that question and any cool stories to share. So, you know, I, when I designed it with Kristen Rodriguez, the kind of intention was everybody always was like, what does it look like? Like, what do you do? And, you know, UDL is not a checklist. So it's kind of a slippery slope because I don't want it to be something that like you're teaching with this in front of you being like, am I doing this? Am I doing this? But just to show the progression that like in order for students to become expert learners, we just have to stop by allowing them different options so they can learn about themselves better as learners. You know, so at like the first stage, we provide them with options. We move away from one size fits all. And it's like, try this or try this, and then really reflect on what's working better for you. And one of the best books I've read all year is by Mike Anderson. It's called um, Learning to Choose, Choosing to Learn. 
Um, and it's not about UDL, but it's about how do you get kids ready to make better choices? And he talks about this three-step process, which is, you know, circular. So it's never ending. It's not a linear thing, but it's, you choose, you do, and then you review. And then based on that review, it, it helps you to make a better choice the next time. And I just like love how simplistic that is because the reason we provide options for students or for staff or for any learner is like you could do it this way or do it this way, but choose one. Okay. And, and maybe the choice is, is terrible, you know, but like think about your, your interests and your needs and the logistics of the task and make the best choice you think you can make. And then you're going to do it. You're going to create some sort of strategy and follow through. But like the golden ticket here is like, how well did that choice allow you to meet the goal? So the reflection piece is like huge. And in order to get students there, we have to start out by just providing students with options. And so when I created it, I think a lot of people like were like, I just want to be here without thinking about the progression means you work through. Like you run a mile and then you run a, a 10K before you run a half marathon before you run a marathon. And that scaffolding the decision-making process is actually a, a very critical step. So I think one cool thing that came out of it is people would be like, well, how do I just, how do I get to proficient? And it's like, well, you, you move through emerging. You scaffold this process of like, you know, these are all ways that you could get to this, this destination and which ones work the best for you. And when they work, you know, how can you replicate and scale and transfer and generalize that? And when they don't work, how can you self-regulate and step back and make a different choice and move forward? And that involves, you know, collaboration and, you know, problem solving and critical thinking. But when we used it, it was like, number one, to allow teachers to self-assess where they're at. So thinking about like, okay, right here, like I'm kind of at this emerging place, but that means that's where your students are at. And so it's not how am a teacher, am I going to move forward, but how are we as a classroom going to move forward? How do I create the conditions of nurture that move from me providing options, which still puts me in a pretty significant position of power to me honoring that students may have options that I have not yet thought of or that I may never think of. And so the more proficient is like, I'm still going to provide you with options because that scaffolding is important and that guidance may be really valuable for some students. But I also want to provide every student with voice and agency. And I want to honor them as learners so they can say to me, I, I know that this is important. You've made it really clear why I need to meet this destination. But instead of doing the things that you put out, could I try to do it this way? You know, and that I think is like how we bring together the importance of personalized learning, because a lot of the times it's just this thought of like, well, I provided them with this and this, and they still didn't learn. And it's, you know, I'm going to do the best I can to uncover what my learners need, but learners will always know themselves better than I could ever know them. And so moving from emerging to proficient is all about sharing that collaboration with students. And if I can do that really, really well, ultimately, I provide students with like the motivation that they need to really be empowered to co-design learning with and besides me. And so again, it can be a self-assessment tool. It can be a collaborative planning tool. It can be a feedback tool for evaluators where you say, you know, as I walked in, I saw that a lot of teacher, you know, a lot of kids were being able to choose between this and this. Have you considered asking them if there's like another way that they could do it? You know, that's how you start moving from emerging to more proficient. And what you'll realize is the power of the design and the power of who gets to make those choices really starts moving away from the teacher and towards the student as you move through. So, you know, from my own experiences, I've had a couple different districts who have turned it into like a Google form for teacher self-assessment. Um, I know a lot of people in my own district, you know, have it highlighted and they'll put it near their desk to type thinking about like, and is it just always me that's allowing those options? Or am I starting to say, what do you need as a learner to get here? Here's the destination. Let's craft all the different journeys. And, um, you know, what's really cool is actually um, a, a gentleman reached out to me in a district in Wisconsin. And basically um, he used it to basically try to determine teachers feelings of their strengths and areas where they really were struggling. And there was like statistical significance in what teachers found to be 
um, easier first steps. They came more comfortable. And, you know, one of the findings is one of the hardest things is that representation piece, which really is the teaching piece. You know, I think it's easier for some of us to say, okay, we can give up the goal setting. We can give up the collaboration. We can give up the assessment. But when it comes down to that presenting information, that's really hard to let go of. Um, and so what are the implications of that in professional development? I think could be pretty cool for a district to say, let's ask teachers, where do you think you're the strongest? What's the hardest for you? And then design universally designed professional development based on those areas where teachers are actually giving their voices and saying, this is what we would like support with the most. Thanks, Katie. That was, you know, I was thinking as you were talking that um, the idea of moving from teacher centered to more student focused to student independence, student voice and choice, it's almost how the guidelines are laid out now, right? They're in the access level where teachers are really providing a lot of the support. And then we move to where we're co sharing that with students, and then where to the degree where students are doing um, really most of the work in the classroom. And I th mm -hmm. think that's a nice parallel with your progression and, and the guidelines. Um, so Corinne, did you have a follow up question for Katie on that? I think there were there were two parts to that, if I'm right. Um, well, I think the second part of that question was just any any cool story. So I think Katie, I love the, um, you know, how you sh shared that at the end of the um, the gentleman who got in contact with you. And um, I do, I love the idea of using that as the uh, teacher self-assessment rubric, just to be able, we talk about getting student voice back into the classroom and what uh, a great opportunity to use the rubric to get teacher voice, like you're saying, back into their building, into their districts and, and talking about what it is they need. So I think that's great. I don't know if you have any um, additional stories to share there was also another question about um, alternatives to removing barriers for reading other than assistive technology. So maybe um, in, in combination with that, if you've come across any teachers of, who have um, come up with some creative ways to help remove barriers to reading other than just um, compensating with assistive tech. I mean, reading is so complex that we really have to break up what is the reading barrier because are we talking, is it like decoding? Is it phonemic awareness? Is it phonics? Is it reading comprehension? You know, like, so when you're talking about reading, it's like this big, vast, you know, um, group of isolated skills. So I would think the first thing would be, you know, what, what are the barriers that are preventing kids from both decoding and, and then comp or comprehending and then coming up with what are the options and choices to like teach those skills. Um, so like in our district, for example, we do universal screening tools, which are like complete low stakes, have nothing to do with students' grades at all. It just helps teachers to like understand better the variability and the types of options and choices that students may need, you know, as we try to create like really inclusive tier one, but also as we start thinking about, we try to design our classrooms in a very workshop model um, where, you know, there's going to be lots of options and choices for students to, you know, either get direct instruction from the teacher if they think that that's going to be valuable, you know, working with technology, working collaboratively. Um, and so, you know, I would say one of the really important things is just thinking about the process of like, what are your diagnostic assessments in reading? Um, how do those diagnostic assessments allow teachers and students to realize what they're really great at and what they need to work on? Um, UDL is a standards-based curriculum design. So once I understand what standard it is they need to work on, then I have to think about what are all the options and choices that will allow students to get to the standard. So for example, if I really want students to understand theme, I would basically say, okay, first I need to make sure you understand the concept of theme. So, you know, you can choose to read anything that you want. I'm going to choose a, a mentor text and we're going to closely read these two paragraphs a few times, you know, and, and you can have the audio version of it. We might act it out. You can choose to like script it as a comic. We're all going to own these two paragraphs. So you understand theme. I'm going to give you some sort of diagnostic assessment. I'm going to say, okay, based on how much you already know about theme, 
you're going to choose one of these four stations to build your understanding. I'm going to give you another quiz in 20 seconds about theme to see, not 20 seconds, in 20 minutes to see what you know about theme. So you can either go watch some brain pop videos. You can come over here with me for direct instruction. You can choose to go back and look um, through the textbook, which is like collecting dust in the back of the room. You know, if you have a better idea, do that. But in 20 minutes, we're going to check in, right? After 20 minutes, I give them a diagnostic assessment on Kahoot. Again, no stakes at all. Just this is going to help you make better decisions about the rest of your plan. So if you were able to um, read the passage and identify the theme, it means you're on kind of the right track. Now you might want to go choose one of these things. If you didn't get it yet, your options are you can come over here with me and do this. You can go on iReady and do one of the, so like it's very based on like what our students not getting. And so, you know, when you have some students who are struggling at reading, 10 students struggling with reading could be struggling for 10 different reasons. And so it's, it's not necessarily the assistive tech. It's taking a zoom back and figuring out about what are their strengths? What are the areas that they don't have yet? And what are other options and choices to get them? Um, a lot of times, let's say in a classroom, it's like, let's all read the chapter of Charlotte's web, but why? Like there's, there's no standard for Charlotte's Web. There's no requirement that everyone reads the same book. Um, you know, Charlotte's Web has significant barriers to access and engagement. And so when you step back and you say, okay, well, it's not just that, okay, they don't like Charlotte's Web. It's what are the reading skills that are missing? And so I would think that, you know, UDL, because it is so focused on firm goals, flexible means, what is the goal? Because reading as a goal is too big. You know, you have to think about all the isolated skills. Um, and, and if that maybe is not an area that's really strong, you know, schools have amazing literacy specialists and there's so many things online. Um, but I work with Cornelius Minor from um, Teachers College in Columbia and he's an amazing author for Heinemann. Um, and we work together um, on something in Massachusetts called the Tiered Literacy Academy. And when we talk about reading, it's, it's really like this concept of literacy is you need to look at all the different skills it takes to be reading and writing and thinking. And, and what's really fascinating is he says, like, one cannot write about something that they cannot say. So let's work on the language and let's work on the listening comprehension before we transfer that to the reading comprehension. Um, but again, that takes a really strong knowledge of what are all the standards that students have to meet and how do we get them to meet them as opposed to reading, which is a, that's like basically saying, how do I run a marathon when we haven't first figured out, do you have the right shoes? You know, do you have the right hydration strategy? Do you have the right coach? Because running a marathon is, is a thousand skills. I love that analogy that, that really puts it into perspective, thinking about, you know, you have to have all the parts before you can get this one great, big, huge whole piece. So um, I, I also think that um, the idea of firm goals and flexible means is so important, not just for, of course, for reading, but for, for, for all of our planning and helping students see that having firm goals is really the, their goal too, right? Figuring out where it is they're headed and then with our help, figuring out how to get there. Mm -hmm. I love that. And especially for reading is so complex. So Katie, I'm curious, you've got to tell us about your four books, three books coming. Three how many are, how many are coming and tell us about them. <laughs> so, um, the, so I have two coming out in March. Um, the first one is written, it's published by Routledge out of London and it's called, um, international implementation of UDL in higher education. And my co-author for that is Dr. Sean Bracken from the UK. And it's an amazing, amazing book. Cause it's a collection of, um, there's 20 chapters and it's from people from 13 different countries who have huge, university-wide initiatives to implement UDL to create more inclusive classrooms. Um, and so, you know, from South Africa to South America to Australia to the UK, and it's, it's just so amazing to see that we're all facing similar barriers and that UDL as a framework has really like transcended all of that. Um, Dr. David Rose wrote the forward to it, which is really exciting because he got to see like where his work has you know, he started this work and now, you know, to see it kind of spread out throughout the world and to see that it's something that 
brings so many of us together has been really cool. So Sean Bracken and I um, co-edited that book together. Um, the official release party for that is going to be at the AHEAD conference in Ireland in March. So that's pretty exciting. Um, I'm also working, um, Allison Posey and I, um, and we partnered with Brian Dean on some of the contributions, um, wrote a book called Unlearning, which is going to be published by Cass. That's also going to be out in March. And that has really been, the focus of that work has been very much on, so often we try to make UDL fit in with a traditional system. And what we're saying is maybe we have to forget about the traditional system and unlearn what we thought was good teaching and then start over with like, what does it mean to be a teacher now when we truly believe in equity and inclusion? So uh, that's gonna be cast. And then I also am working with Marco Chardon and we're writing a book right, right now, the working title is Social Justice in the Hands of Educators. And we have multiple publishers right now looking at that. Um, and that's really about taking this UDL lens and realizing that when we're talking about culturally sustaining pedagogy, when we're talking about responsive classroom, when we're talking about restorative justice, when we're talking about windows and mirrors, what we're really talking about is eliminating barriers. And so taking like a bird's eye view at saying that social justice is really about eliminating the barriers and deconstructing the systems that are based on dominant culture and privilege and implicit bias um, and practical strategies to do that in the classroom. Okay, I'm exhausted. <laughs> Those are wonderful and so diverse. That's, I'm Ed Sharon. I'm telling you, Ed Sharon. It's crazy. You went from institutes of higher education to thinking about learning and unlearning mm -hmm. all the way down to um, classroom culture. I mean, it's just so broad. That's wonderful. It's been Ed a great Sharon. ride. Pardon me? I said, it's been a great ride. I bet. So, um, Steve, it looks like you might have a question on Twitter that you'd like to share. Yeah, Katie, one of the things that uh, I'd like to little, know a little bit more about is how you've used your own story to empathize with the educators who face those early mindset barriers with UDL and help them in getting started. Yeah, sure. sorry, my plug keeps falling out. My plug is giving me barriers right now. This Mac plug is too heavy. Okay, hold on. I'm working with it. I am a problem solver. I will persist. Okay. So um, what I would say, so right now I'm actually teaching a course in my own district called the UDL Design Lab, which is a hybrid online course. And um, this is my fifth year in my district as an assistant superintendent. And it was basically, I started moving away from me offering PD after the third year, because I didn't want UDL to be perceived as like a Katie Novak thing. Like it's endorsed by federal legislation and it's written into our state MTSS blueprint and it's in our district strategy. Um, but what I was afraid of was that happened coincidentally at the same time I was hired. And so it looked very much like a personal pet project as opposed to like I'm here to support a really important national initiative and so um, after I trained a certain number of teachers in it I, I tried to move myself out of the professional development in UDL and instead support the facilitators and that's what I've done for the past couple of years and now we're starting to get feedback that are like we are literally like we need more you know the original people who were trained were like there needs to be something for us. And so I'm offering this online course. And what's really interesting is a couple of the people who, you know, literally almost wrote something like this was like, you know, we thought it was going to go away. It's not. So I guess now we're going to get trained in it, like in the most loveliest of ways. And one of my colleagues wrote and said, like, now that we're, you know, this is really clear that this is a part of the Edival rubric and this is happening. Like, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I have to say I'm resistant. And I was like, oh my gosh, I totally was resistant as well. I completely understand. Like if I can't, if I can't build the why it's the same thing with students is you can't just say to kids, learn this, it's important. And they're like, oh, okay. Cause we know that doesn't work. And you know, so the reality is, is all the different messaging in the past five years, you know, as much as I wish that I could lie and say that it's met every single person's need, it, it hasn't, but I understand completely that that's up to me as an educator to make that happen. And, you know, there was absolutely no hard feelings at all. And I was like, I was in your boat. And if there was no stipend, I probably would have been dragging my feet forever. And, you know, I, I am so happy that you're taking this class and never feel bad about telling me that's where you're at. Um, but I think that the, the really important aspect of that is because 
I was very resistant to things that I didn't think were good for kids. And if you're resistant to this, it's because you haven't realized yet that it's good for kids. And it's our job as professional development providers and colleagues to make that clear. And, and, and we'll figure out a way to do that. But I think that sometimes that's helpful, like, because I would be the first person to be like, I'm not doing that. It's not good for kids. <laughs> so, you know, and, and one of the things too, that I think is helpful is, is in my own district, what I can do and which I've done many times is when people say this just won't work with my kids, I'll say, okay, I'll give me a standard. I'll come in and teach. Um, that is a full offer for anyone in my district at any time. I can't say people take me up on it a lot of times, but um, I always am saying, if you feel like you can't get to this rigor and make it accessible, email me a standard and I'll come in and you can evaluate me. Like you don't have to teach in front of me. Let me teach in front of you. Cause I believe in the power of all kids. And I believe that if they know you believe in them, you'll make growth. Yeah. I, I think that you're, you're again, right on with that, that, you know, all of our teachers come at it from a different angle. And it, it reminds me of what you said at the beginning that we have to allow people to come at it from their level of comfort and find that one place that makes sense to them and dig in from there. And I think that's what you're suggesting that we have to just allow teachers the room to find their place, to determine where the start is for them. It's wonderful. So Katie, I'm wondering, can you share with us one or two maybe memorable lessons or memorable um, uh, thing, outcomes that you've had from teachers in your, in your district? Like what have they taught you about UDL? Oh my God. I mean, they're all way better teachers than I am now. I mean, like, cause they, I mean, I, I moved to administration after five years of being trained in UDL and like they're at five years and it's like, we're not worthy. Um, today I had an amazing meeting with some of um, my colleagues at the high school. And basically the meeting was, all right, let's get crazy, go innovative, go crazy. We know that variability works. Okay. We understand that that's the rule, not the exception. We believe in inclusion. One of our district goals is to move towards proportional scheduling, which means that every course looks like the district. So if we have 15, 16% of students with disabilities, every class will have between 15 and 20 and no class is going to topple that and no class is going to be less. So, you know, it, a lot of the times in districts, when you talk about like need for inclusive practices, sometimes you get pushback, which is very well deserved where teachers are like, but what I'm doing is effective. Well, when you have only students who arrive ready to learn, your, your, you know, your, your inclusive practices don't need to be as at the forefront, you know? So like if you're, you know, in an honors class and you have an honors class and all students arrive ready to learn, it's going to be, you know, you'll, you'll have a much better chance of success without using all these different options and choices. You might have a lower level of engagement, but compliance by the time you start separating kids tends to be a little different. And so one of the things we talked about is like, okay, we're going to proportionally schedule. We're working on inclusive practices who wants to try something crazy? And so I met with colleagues today and like one of my colleagues was like, I am 100% confident and comfortable right now. I wanna teach a class that is ninth and 10th grade English in the same class together, which is regular and open honors all together embedded in a class. I can meet all their needs. And like, I'm like, Whoa. like, I mean, that's, that's awesome and aggressive. So we're like, okay, what do you need to do it? Like whatever you need, who do you want common prep time with? What do you need for curriculum? Um, but like, that's the kind of thing that it's just like, it makes me want to step back and be like, I'm not worthy of any of this because to be a part of someone's journey where they can see like 100% give me any kid for any reason within two grades and I can make it work. And, and so we're going to move forward. So I would say like hearing ideas like that and, and knowing that people feel comfortable enough bringing those ideas up um, makes me like really, really excited because I think that's going to be awesome for kids. In the same meeting, I have a world language teacher that's like, I want to teach a Spanish class, you know, but I want to do it about contemporary issues. So can we team teach with a Spanish teacher and teach a contemporary issues class only in Spanish? We're like, do it because we do organic world language and it's full immersion and like, you know, so it's those kind of things on the high school end, you go down to the total opposite end, you know, where you're looking at your pre-K and kindergarten. Um, my kindergarten teacher is now teaching like UDL courses for other districts um, because we did our own kind of 
district pep rally, you know, UDL conference, which sold out and people from other districts are now hiring my teachers to be UDL consultants, you know, and I'm like, I couldn't be prouder of my colleagues, but you see a kindergarten teacher and a fifth grade teacher and an eighth grade teacher and a 12th grade teacher at a table together being like, yes, this is really powerful. Um, you know, that gives me so much hope about its scalability everywhere, you know, cause I taught English and I taught middle school. And so Sometimes when I talk, it's very easy to come up with a barrier that says, yeah, but she doesn't know math, but she doesn't know pre-K. And I mean, that's fair. But the reality is, is now I have someone in every subject, every grade in schools that are like mine, in schools that are different than mine, who say this is really effective too. And that is what keeps me going. Wow, that is so powerful to have that diverse of a group be so brave and say, we're just going to do it. Yeah. These are the kids. This is what we got to do. Mm. Give me this stuff. And you're super, I mean, how responsive of you to say, you're going to reward that bravery. What do you need? There you go. That's it, was a, awesome. it was a pretty cool day. So, and yeah. again, we're not there all the time because when you think about where a district is, you have variability within your district, you know, within your buildings, within your yeah. teachers. But the one thing that I know unequivocally for sure is every single teacher that I have is doing the best they can with what they have for what they believe is the best for kids. And the professional development is where you have to address things like compliance is not the best thing for kids. Tracking is not the best thing for kids. Even though the numbers may look good, like there's a much bigger future for them than following directions and doing things in one way. But if, if you're not there yet, just know that it's a journey and you'll get there. Yeah. And, and believing in your teachers that they really are doing what they think is best. Yeah. Really sends that respect. And, you know, that's so help. That's so powerful to uh, educators to know that they're trusted. Right. Corinne, I think you had a couple more questions uh, in the chat. Uh, so Katie, there's a couple of questions out here about writing curriculum using the UDL framework. So uh, suggestions about how to tackle that, to begin to tackle that, um, you know, writing curriculum, writing uh, scope and sequence um, courses. And um, Meg even asked, what about curriculum writing in a district who's new to UDL? So any thoughts about that? So my, my lens of curriculum writing, which is not the only way, so take it with a grain of salt, is when we are doing our curriculum scope and sequence, the only things I'm interested in are going to be the um, the overall topic of the unit, the essential question of the unit, the standards, and then how they're going to assess it. But we give teachers and departments autonomy of how they're going to get students to answer those essential questions and how they're going to reach the standards. So I can actually share my screen really quick. I'm going to brag on one of my amazing colleagues right now. Um, let's see. I'll share it in one second, but we're actually working on revising our scope and sequences right now. And you're basically, I think it will make more sense when you see it because it'll be like, oh, I see what you're doing here. Um, so I'm just gonna show you one really quickly for molecular biology. You know, we've been talking about English and elementary and I'm gonna throw some love out to some science teachers out here. Okay, hold on one sec. And so when we talk about like, what's really interesting is when you step back and you think about what is it that students really need to know and be able to do, I think that is the most powerful, powerful aspect of curriculum writing that you could ever do. So I'm just going to show you again one unit really quickly here from a molecular biology class. And we have a template like this for what we're going to do is build one for every single grade and every single subject. And the reason we're doing this is to really focus on, um, okay, so let's see how I can share this. Share my screen. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in and this will be quick and dirty. But basically what you see here is if I get bigger, there we go. Um, basically, like the, the science department or the science teacher will come together and then they'll say, oop. I don't want that. That was, that was a little aggressive. And they'll say, okay, so in the first unit, it's really all about cells and micro modules and you'll spend about two weeks or so on it. But like what they really want kids to know is at the end of this two weeks, every kid will be able to understand like how does molecular structure relate to function? Okay. And then how are they going to know that students understand how molecular structure relates to function is they're going to do some web-based problem sets. They're going to do a summative units, a test. They're going to do lab activities. Um, 
and then they're going to align to those standards. But what you can see there is that provides for a lot of teacher autonomy. So, you know, a lot of times when you have scope and sequence, you see this on day two, you must be on page 13 of this text. Um, as if page 13 of the text is a panacea to solve all the world science problems. You know, we've had textbooks for years and we're like 25th in the world on, uh, on science achievement. So like clearly the textbook thing isn't going so hot. So when we think about what is it really that we want students to know and do, if a teacher says like for two weeks, you know, I wanna make it so, so clear that all students can answer those questions because that aligns to this these essential standards, when you do that and you allow the teachers to create their own scope and sequences in their departments, you end up with a really, really cool foundation that then like lends itself to UDL. And so when we're creating scope and sequence, we're saying our job as teachers is to create standards-based units. That is what the Danielson framework and the Marzano framework say. So if you are in any Edival system at all, it's gonna be pulling from those. And also a lot of them actually say, like if you go really closely and you look at like the mass state frameworks is unsatisfactory is relying on your textbook. Okay, in order to get to like a proficient, it needs to be creates engaging opportunities for students to interact with the standards, you know, using your text as a foundation. I am in no way, shape or form anti-curriculum, but if curriculum was so fabulous, then robots could just deliver it and then we could all just retire now. So um, that is my answer is scope and sequence work should really start with what is it that students need to know and be able to do? How are we gonna measure if they can know and do that based on the standards? And then you start talking about what do we need to get us there? A lot of the times it goes backwards, like we're gonna buy this thing and we're gonna follow it. And then you're like, mm, you become almost like I am on chapter two, but it's like, but why? Like, what is it that students need to know and be able to do in chapter two? So I think that the marriage of curriculum with a strong scope and sequence that is curriculum agnostic becomes a really successful way to use a curriculum with fidelity, meaning you're following through, you're providing the resources as options. And then also saying to students, if this is not allowing you to meet this goal, what will. And that's really what UDL at its most beautiful form is about, is teaching kids how to learn. Absolutely. Um, I love that, to have that clarity about what it is that student needs, students need to do and how you're going to determine when they do it. And then the rest of it, you know, just use the framework and use your professional judgment and that it's great experience and, and the relationship with you have, you have with your kids and your resources. So um, I think that that's, that's, um, advice that is helpful to a lot of people tonight. So thank you for sharing that. So I'm, I'm going to flip this a little bit on you now just to shake things up. So on the flip side, when you have the curriculum in the box that you're delivered that says you will do this and you will meet this pacing guide and yes, on Tuesday, you'll be on page 13. And even though we know that that's um, in our hearts, not what we hope for, but when you're not giving the chance, given that um, autonomy around it, what suggestions do you have for people who might be in that situation and how do you use the framework to make the best of that? I mean, I, my answer would kind of be the same of like, if you take the curriculum and you break it down, okay, let's look at unit one in this curriculum that we bought. What is it really that this, this curriculum is trying to get students to know and do, right? And if you can figure that out, like really clearly, what are the power standards? What are the essential questions? You know, what are the assessments? Even if the assessments are in the unit, if you go and do all of that work and then you go to an administrator, truly respectfully as a partner, and you say, you know, I know that UDL is something that we're focusing on as a district. I believe this is a really strong curriculum and I think it's a really great professional development tool. And I love how it meets the needs of many of my students. But when I was breaking down what it is that students know and need to know and be able to do, and then I did this diagnostic assessment, I saw that some kids really need a little more remediation and some kids need a little more enrichment. And I was thinking about providing these options and still staying on task. I would be shocked as an administrator who knows a lot of administrators that someone would say, no, you can't collect data on that and see if it's effective. You know, I think a lot of the times the curriculum becomes because everybody's all over the place. 
And with a scope and sequence, you're not all over the place. You know, it's saying that at the end of this four weeks, like I'm going to tell you that my kids are going to understand the molecular structure and how it relates to function. And maybe those three kids watch videos and maybe these kids sat with me in a small group for a week. And maybe these kids, you know, went to the class next door because they gave an option to do like, but I'm going to tell you, I can show you the data on the pre-test and the post-test that they have it. That's what a curriculum is developed for. And I think that if teams become expert learners themselves and are part, it's the same thing as like, I don't think any teacher ever, if a kid came up eloquently and respectfully and said, I know that you want me to do this. And I was doing some research and I thought that I could still meet the standard in this way. Would you mind if I try it? If it doesn't work out, I'm happy to go back to the other way. No teacher's going to be like, no, don't try it. And so I think that giving administrators the benefit of the doubt that like, they're responsible for making the student achievement increase. And they're gonna do that in the best way that they know how, and in the best way that their association and the state and whatever is above them tells them how. And you know, uh, some of the research on curriculum is compelling because they throw out numbers and they'll tell you kids can gain 6%. Well, if you're 20% proficient and you go up to 26, I guess it's a game, but that's still terrible. So it's, but like everyone is, is trying, right? And so the, the stress that teachers feel, administrators often feel, you know, because the state has all these mandates. And I think teachers get the worst of it because they have to deal with that all and be incredibly resilient for kids. And administrators, when necessary, can close their office door you know, and take a deep breath and have a hot coffee. And as, as a teacher, you don't get that luxury. But I think that having conversations, like I get it, you adopted this curriculum because 80% of our kids are not meeting standards. I get it. And this is a standards-based curriculum. But when I gave this pre-assessment, some of my kids aren't there yet. So I wanna provide this option. I, Again, tell them to call me if they push back because I, I just don't see it happening. Like I, we want to have conversations with teachers. We want to work with teachers. We want it to be a collaboration. And sometimes it just feels like people are like, well, I, I don't have the right materials to help kids. So we're like, here, take this, follow it. You'll help kids. And, and everyone knows in their heart, if that worked, you wouldn't need teachers. You could just get somebody who's literate to follow it. Um, but again, what is the alternative? The alternative is giving people a whole lot of professional development on how to determine power standards, essential standards, you know, creating their own assessments. And that's hard too. So you, you gotta, you gotta meet in the middle. Yeah. And it, it occurs to me that that goes back to, as you were talking about earlier, just this mutual respect, right? That teachers respect each other. They respect their administration, administration respects teachers. And that's really how, how things get done especially for the benefit of kids. So Katie, we only have a few minutes left. So I would like you to have an opportunity to talk about in your choice, if you wanted to talk just briefly about what you see as the future of the field in UDL, or if you just wanna give some closing remarks, either one is fine since we only have a few minutes left. I am still like utterly shocked how many people have never heard of it. Like it, it blows my mind. Like I'll go to states to present that it's like required <laughs> by the state MTSS plan. And I always start with like a quick diagnostic of like, you know, I'll, I'll put like this really rich statement about UDL. Like UDL is about embracing all variability for expert learners. And it's like on a scale of one to four, how do you feel about the statement? Like I a hundred percent understand what it is. Um, you know, having trouble with some concepts, what the hell are you talking about kind of thing. And I'm always amazed at how many people are like, never heard of it, didn't know what it stood for, you know? And so I worry about the future of UDL because I have always said that I fear that UDL has a PR problem. It is a framework built on 30 years of research in neuroscience that has thousands of studies on all these different aspects of like the importance of scaffolding, the importance of self-regulation. And, and because things like Genius Hour and Personalized Learning have a better PR campaign, people jump on those trails without the strong evidence-based and without the equity perspective. And then you end up with kids are all doing different things, but no one's working towards a goal. They aren't understanding how to be learners. All they learn is like, if I follow my passions, it's more fun. And guess what? That's not life. And so like, I, I hope that the future is that people start to recognize that UDL is not a thing that you buy. It's not a thing that you do. It is, it's a, a, 
and understanding that when people don't learn, it's not because people are disabled, it's the environments that we create are disabled and we have to eliminate barriers. And that brings in a lot more frameworks to eliminate those barriers, like restorative practice, like sometimes purchasing curriculum, like universal screening tools. So we really understand where kids are at. And it's the umbrella that brings together all of these different things we're trying to do in education. And I always fear that not enough people know that and how are we going to turn that around? And so I think that, you know, the, the, those of us who are doing this work and those of us who are here, like I am so driven to just like write and share and treat because it's like maybe one person reads something that they've never read before. Um, but, but right now I think there's a real risk of it getting clouded over by much sexier and far less effective frameworks that do not truly embrace teachers or learners. Um, and that's what I'm seeing now is like, I'll go to districts and the feedback when I first get there, you know, I'll be like, if someone didn't want to be here today, tell me why they wouldn't want to be here. And it's like a really safe way for people to tell you exactly what they're thinking. And so many people are like, either I've never heard of UDL or like UDL is old news. And that's a PR problem. And so how are we going to fix it? So people recognize that like, I don't know of many other frameworks that believe that every single teacher and every single student has the ability to become an expert learner. And if there was, I would transition over to it, but it has yet to exist. And, and so how are we going to scale? Cause I hope the future is that everyone knows what it is and everyone knows that it's pretty agnostic about what kind of school that you're in or what you teach or what you purchase or what your resources are. Um, and we still have a long way to go to cross that chasm. So I think I just heard the call to action. I think Katie just called us all out to get on Twitter, to talk to our colleagues, to shout it from the mountaintop, right? That this is work that we have to do. Jamie wanted to be uh, sure that I mentioned that um, just so everybody in the audience is aware, we now have at least 23 states that have adopted UDL in relation to uh, ESSA. So we are making some progress, but I, I think, you, Katie, your closing remarks are, are really spot on. We've got to make sure that we are standing and shouting and sharing our stories, too. So um, I'm going to just do, speaking of sharing stories, my job now is to um, share a uh, to sell a little bit of soap here. So let me um, get here to our closing for the night. Um, just want to remind everybody if you um, were past participant uh, or maybe past presenter or maybe just wanting to go that our UDL IRN Summit is coming up uh, March the pre-conferences are March 27th and they, um, the full summit is March 28th and 29th. And I believe Katie will be there speaking to all of us. So uh, it's time to register. Just go ahead and jump on udlirn.org and you can make your uh, registration and um, make your plans for staying with us in, in Orlando. It's going to be a wonderful three days of learning. It's, it's probably the most fun learning opportunity on the planet is my opinion. <laughs> um, so, and also wanted to just mention that um, we have a new regional event coming up in California. So if any of you are near Roseville, California, come on out and join UDL Learn and Lead. It's inaugural event. It is February 6th and 7th, and you can register for that event at udlirn.org as well. So as soon as you're on the main page of the UDL IRN, you'll see links to both events and just click on the event of choice. Finally, just a reminder that UDL chat, speaking of uh, sharing your story, happens every first and third Wednesday of the month. So make sure you're out there joining uh, the many voices who share their passion for UDL um, on the first and third Wednesday of each month. And finally, thank you, Katie. Thank you for uh, a wonderful night of sharing. Um, I don't know about all of you, but I'm exhausted. <laughs> you really bring so much energy to this work. And we really all thank you very much for joining us. So if you just want to say goodbye, we'll, we'll close out for the night. It's time to go and do some reading now. I'm reading the graveyard stories. Has anyone read those? They're amazing. No, I haven't even heard of those yet. Oh yeah, it is amazing. It won the Newberry. I'm reading them with my fourth grader who he's not necessarily it's called the graveyard book it won the newberry medal he is not what you would call he would not characterize himself as a reader yet um 
but it is amazing. It, like, I, I'm not even going to ruin it for you, but it's essentially a human live boy gets raised by ghost in a graveyard and it's awesome. Wow. <laughs> All right, everybody go grab a book. <laughs> Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. All right, so we're going to stop this recording. Great job, Sue. Well, Great job, thank Ray. you guys. Uh, thank you, Sue. All right.